we can just get started um, after all that hustle. Thanks everyone for being here and uh, thanks for the patience. Um, so today I'll be uh, talking a little bit about Rootstock and um, set chain on Bitcoin. So some fun fact, um, going back to 2015, um, a bunch of technologists and entrepreneurs in Argentina in that time thought it would be a great idea to create a smart contract platform on top of the Bitcoin, so leverage the security and also the Ethereum's um, programmability. So that's exactly what they did. And in terms of a set chain, um, I don't know how many of you guys actually have heard of Rootstock or ours. A few of them. Excellent, great. So take it easy on me for the techno details. Um, so a set chain is essentially a blockchain that would have to satisfy three conditions. So the first one is it has a native token packed to a parent chain token in a way that permits secure transfers between both chains. So it should be extremely secure from Bitcoin network, uh, mainnet to rootstock. And the second, it doesn't require a money token that's different from the main token of the parent chain to function. So essentially, you don't create a platform specific token and then that token to go to move, but we'll, we'll explain what other ways you know, to, to have the upside. And the third one is it achieves transaction finality independently from the parent chain. And I think that's a super key because that's kind of qualifies how it's its own independent chain rather than just like a, a mirror of the of the Bitcoin mainnet. And then Rootstock achieved all three conditions. And going back to the key value proposition, when the platform was um, launched in January, uh, January 3rd, actually 2018. Um, it basically said it was designed to combine the securities and the store of value of the Bitcoin network as well as the compatibility and the programmability that's brought by Ethereum. So, you know, two plus the very expensive uh, network of smart contract based DeFi applications and networks. Um, so some very key characteristics and that's where, you know, the kind of the design mechanisms um, kick in. So very first, security. Merge mining mechanism um, that essentially secured, secures Rootstock using the Bitcoin proof of work. So what that means is the Bitcoin miners, um, the mining pools such as Luxor, Antpool, uh, the Brings, and the, the Via BTCs, while they were mining Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network, they were simultaneously mining and secure, secures the, um, the Rootstock. Network, so that's kind of how the security is being introduced into the chain. It obviously follows the proof of work um, as a consensus mechanism. The second core design mechanism is the bridge between the Bitcoin mainnet and the rootstock. So there is a federated chain, a bridge in between that kind of moves the um, the Bitcoin from the mainnet to the rootstock. So it's not like a, a wrapped BTC concept. It's more like a synthetic. Uh, where you basically lock, every time you lock one bit BTC or main, mainnet, you release another equivalent amount of BTC in the form of RBTC or Rootstock. So I think I did something wrong here again. Oops. I have to go back to my, <laughs> you're gonna hate me for this, but let me see. Okay. And you know, we did a, a, our research team did um, a little bit of study in 2022. Um, essentially, compared the Popac bridge on Rootstock to all the other Bitcoin bridges. So there are some trade-offs, and there are different dimensions you can judge the, the bridge from. The um, the type of the bridge is it federated? Is it collateralized? Is it centralized? Right? And also the stage, the decentralization level, the speed, the cost, how usable it is as well as all the other elements. And the conclusion that we, we got, obviously, was a little bit of a bias, um, is that Rootstock is the best in terms of the trade-off between security and decentralization. Um, the only weak spot that we had in terms of this bridge is the speed limit, right? It is, it is taking a long time to, there's a pack in when you get to the Rootstock with the RBTC, the pack out is, is slow, and it takes more than 24 hours. And we're addressing that with the introduction of the flyover protocol. The second characteristic is um, store value. So as mentioned, Smart Bitcoin or RBTC is the native token on um, Rootstock. So you can use RBTC to pay gas fees. There's no wrapping required. 
and you can access our VTC through the toll pack. You can obviously purchase it on you know, exchanges and, and so on, but it's not sensible, sensible. The third one is compatibility. So all the Ethereum smart contracts can be directly deployed on Rootstock. So this is our hope is you know, making it super easy for Solidity developers to come and explore Rootstock. So just bring their smart contracts and their programming ability, you know, their ability to program and to code, and it's the same standards that we apply on Rootstock. This is sort of where we're working on right now, um, is the scalability. So just to be completely honest, we are um, at 30 seconds um, per block time. It's not that fast. We are um, looking at four cents per transaction, which is probably more expensive than Polygon. Um, there's a ZK Sync um, implementation on testnet, but we're not fully there yet, right? We haven't fully rolled out on mainnet. We're looking at the new trends like roll kit, subway roll ups, as well as like the um, zero sync, right? Very, very interesting kind of roll ups on um, Bitcoin that is essentially enabled by the Taproot upgrade, and I think that's a really great thing that we're, we're exploring right now. So some stats. The one thing um, worth mentioning is we never got you know, basically hacked. We're up 100% since we uh, launched in 2018. There is a total of more than always constantly over 55% of uh, Bitcoin merge mining hash rate on Rootstock. So we're super secure um, in that sense. We're, um, we're seeing a the growth in you know, addresses, transactions, as well as the TBL locked on um, in the two-way pack. The one thing that we're trying to build is uh, essentially the financial primitives on Bitcoin, the functionalities that we can actually enable um, for the Bitcoin community. So we have so far um, enabled, help support some of the DeFi platforms, like Sovereign is a quite well-known um, DeFi platform. It's uh, essentially the trading platform that also has um, introduced stable coins like Dollar. They have, you know, you can, you can trade in very different Instruments, we have Tropicas, which is a decentralized lending um, protocol that serves the Latin American uh, market specifically. You have money on chain. It's a, a stablecoin protocol native on Rootstock. But also, I think we're placing a very big emphasis on partnerships with non-custodial wallets because that's kind of where we see we drive the next billion or next like 500 million users to um, to crypto is going through those non-custodial wallets and where they engage with their end users directly. So we've, um, we've worked with you know, MetaMask, Snap, Liquality, Edge, and so on. And also make sure we have exchanges, so the liquidity networks and ramps, as well as some very critical integrations with um, protocols like AKS3, as well as the Fireblocks as our wallet um, and custody partners. So this is kind of like what we, I wanted to touch on um, specifically today. So there's a lot of um, narratives and, and um, uh, statements about where you see the next wave or next phase of adoption for crypto and how do you kind of phrase them, right? And in our view, this is essentially everyday DeFi. And so what is, what is everyday DeFi? And um, you know, on behalf of the company, our VLab, which is a key contributor to Rootstock, is Everyday DeFi is the very opposite of um, speculative DeFi. So, right, so it's, it's the opposite of advanced and complex DeFi. It's supposed to be um, the type of DeFi that is super ac accessible and easy to use by everyday normal people, and especially the, the users that are um, in the emerging markets or dealing with uh, very volatile currencies. They really need alternatives for wealth protection, um, inflation protection, for instance, and also they need access to the financial um, rails or systems that they currently don't have it, right? And how do you enable, um, meet their needs in sort of very simple um, UX, UI, and also who do you partner with to bring those functionalities to them? So all of that is make, making up the concept of everyday DeFi, and we think that um, this is the biggest opportunity, essentially, not only for Bitcoin, but for the cryptocurrency today. And you guys might be very familiar with this adoption curve. Every new technology went through this, this phase where they um, dealt with five very different customers in different phases of the adoption. 
Um, there's the, on the very left, there's innovators and early adopters. Those are the early markets and early people. So think about in the context of crypto, the phase one, the innovators are the OGs, right? They're the cypherpunks who have bought their first Bitcoin before Bitcoin existed. Um, so they're the, um, they're the holders and maxis, and then there are still a lot of them around. So that's the first phase, um, very, very small group of people. Then you move on to the second phase, which is advanced DeFi. So the advanced DeFi are the DGEN traders. They are the uh, stakers to the credit pools. Um, they are the uh, speculative traders. They love trading on you know, the upside of new tokens. And we see a lot of that in the more advanced um, markets, like in the US and um, some parts of Europe. And they are very, very tech savvy um, retail um, users of uh, crypto. Then there's a huge chasm, and therefore the whole kind of curve is called crossing the chasm, is how do you move from those early markets to the mainstream markets, which is made of you know, early majority, late majority, and the laggards, right? So think about, this, the early majorities are um, how we think about everyday DeFi, because we think that's, this is where we essentially are today, is you start seeing the stable coin adoption, you have a large cap of, of um, crypto in stable points and the people use that for remittances or money transfers and they um, save on stable coins. It's very, very safe. It's very modest return, but um, it's, it's something different. And then they can use um, stable coins for borrowing. They can collateralize their crypto and, and borrow. There's P2P um, payments as well. And I think that wave of users kind of came out of the pandemic quite strong. So you kind of saw that growth um, very, very obviously, and then you start seeing the developing countries are escaping kind of the, the existing sort of monopolies of their finance um, and monetary policy and how they kind of went to the, the stable points for, for protection. So this is the everyday DeFi, and then you will move on to, hopefully in the future, invisible DeFi and, and your grandparents, you know, the most kind of so the traditional users or non-users become um, very open to it and start actually getting exposed to it. So this is sort of the how we see um, the everyday DeFi in the context of the adoption curve. Um, and this is more like a mentioning an announcement. So um, one thing that the company is trying to do to accelerate the, the growth of the Rootstock ecosystem um, is that we're going to launch a uh, grants program this year, and then backed by very generous uh, rewards. It's a total of $2.5 million. Um, we're going to provide, provide funding and also other kinds of support to developers, researchers, and builders in the space who can make um, impact on the, the growth of Rootstock and, and the infrastructure layer of the Rootstock. So we're aiming for 100 qualified grantees that can deliver um, capabilities or drive user adoption. And therefore, um, they can more people and more projects can leverage Bitcoin and Rootstock as a consensus layer. So this is, you know, examples like where you see Rootstock and other scaling layers connect together, and how you kind of create more um, more killer apps, you know, using the current um, stack as well. So it's it's quite open. We don't have very strict um, conditions on the use cases at all. So in May we'll um, be announcing more details of the program. And in addition to sort of incentivizing the, the community to come and build with us, we, um, we have also um, developed a lot of infrastructure and the building blocks on top of Rootstock and internally within the company. So RIP is the, um, the building block um, layer that is supposed to uh, be used for accelerator Rootstock. So again, you know, think about um, how in the context of um, everyday DeFi, we wanted the RIP to be the um, the tool, the tooling, and the product suite that can drive useful, affordable, scalable fintech services on the Rootstock um, blockchain. And under the hood, there are um, seven very different, distinctly, distinctively different components. And starting with a out of box wallet infrastructure. So if you want to build a non custodial wallet, and come talk to me and with us, we have um, free infrastructure for you to explore with. And also we have name service, which is essentially um, works just like ENS, but it's on Bitcoin, on Rootstock, 
um, there's a flyover, which I kind of mentioned before. It was it's an uh, implementation that introduces the LP um, concept in the uh, the Polpack bridge, so making that whole transaction from BTC to RBDC and backwards much faster. Then you also will uh, will also have gateways and um, relay and roll up solutions. And how to how to leverage the the RIF protocol and the product suite? So we have. Um, decided to roll out this program. It's essentially called a co-creation program where we wanted to um, partner with fintechs and the leading uh, crypto companies to focus on some of the primary interesting non speculative use cases. So such as inflation protection, borderless payments, equitable lending, all of those are super relevant to um, our key markets such as Latin America and other world um, emerging markets in the world. So just a quick kind of introduction, how that process is gonna work, right? So essentially what we, um, we've put together a team with the best developers, engineers, and um, product teams within the company, and we'll be talking to maybe like 100 companies and identify who are most interested to kind of discover the real world problems, and we'll um, prototype and we'll um, ideate together and arrive at the product um, and product ideas. So um, we'll also be supporting their launches of the products is through co-marketing and other commercial support. This is it, it's a QR. Um, if you want to get in touch quickly with the RIF, RIF team, um, or just come talk to me, it's um, kind of look after the commercial teams right now for the, for the company, so that's it. Thank you so much.